this is your story. And by story, I mean, this is your life. So what happens next? What do you want to happen next? And what are you, what are you waiting for? And are you going to let this inner voice that's talking you out of it or telling you that, you know, you're not worthy or good enough or that you're not ready? Do you want that to be the leading voice of, you know, of the story? Um, Because ultimately we are in charge. And I think if we can quiet down that, that critical questioning, doubting voice enough, you can listen to your true inner voice, which comes a little more from your gut and your heart than an overthinking brain. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotches marmet We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Hello and welcome to episode 125 of the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so excited to share our new podcast episode format that is going to start dropping monthly. We actually had our first one drop about three weeks ago and it's called a health transformation audit. It's just 15 minutes and what we're going to do is bring you, our community members, onto our show for this short health transformation audit, where we will guide you to identify what's holding you back from your ideal health and wellness, and really encourage you to think about that vision, create a vision for yourself of what you want your life to look like. And then we'll analyze it with you kind of going back and forth so that you can walk away with a tangible action step that you can implement immediately. We're so excited about these episodes as integrative health practitioners and holistic health coaches. We just love doing this kind of work with you. So we highly encourage you to grab a warm beverage, get cozy, and head on over to episode 121, where you will hear from Kim, who was our first community member on the show. And even better, we would love to have you on. So you can click the link in our show notes or simply send us an email at the art of living well podcast at gmail.com and let us know that you'd like to sign up for your 15 minute health transformation audit. We look forward to connecting with you. And before we dive into today's episode, we want to ask that if you're enjoying this podcast, if you could please leave us a rating and review on Apple podcast, doing so takes just two minutes, but it really helps us to reach more people so that others can benefit from the inspiring conversations and resources that we share each week. And of course, if you're enjoying today's episode, we would love it if you would share it on social media and tag us or send it to a friend, a family member, or anyone who you think may benefit from this information. We are so excited to share with you today's guest, Valerie Gordon. Valerie Gordon is an award-winning television producer, content creator, and longtime storyteller. Through her career and communication strategy firm, Commander and She, Valerie offers keynote presentations, group workshops, and personal and corporate strategizing to help clients harness the power of story. A 10-time Emmy and three-time Edward R. Murrow Award winner, Valerie's television work has appeared on HBO Sports, CBS News, ESPN, Weekend Today, and Lifetime. Through Commander and She, Valerie combines her storytelling background with her passion for advocating for women in the workforce. She provides high-achieving women with career tools and communication skills necessary to ascend the leadership ladder and works with corporations to develop and retain future talent. In her recent book, Fire Your Narrator, a storyteller's guide to getting out of your head and into your life, she explores the impact and influence of the stories we tell ourselves on our career success and satisfaction. Today's conversation with Valerie was not only extremely enlightening, but so fun. She starts out sharing her story about how she left her one satisfying career as a producer after she found herself crying to her dog on the floor of her closet. It was at this pivotal moment that she started asking herself, 
what she didn't want anymore before she started figuring out what she did want. We know that many people will relate to Valerie's story, one in which she achieved a lot in her career, but felt like she had missed out quite a bit with her kids, who at this point were already teenagers. Valerie shares her tips and strategies in her new book about how to get off the closet floor. And I know many of us have been there. And we dive in and talk about this inner voice, this inner narrator, which is what her book is really about. And she inspires people to get out of your head, squash your inner narrator, turn down the volume of those gremlin voices, and really start to become the author of your narrative. We love how she encourages each of us to name the inner narrator, and Marnie shares on this during this episode what her inner narrator is called. And that inner narrator is the voice that's telling you that you're not good enough or you're not worthy enough and really brings you down and holds you back from achieving what you want to achieve. We dive in and talk about Valerie's new book, Fire Your Narrator. And the book, I have to just say, is so well written. It's easy to follow and it has such amazing tips and strategies. And of course, Valerie uses lots of stories, which just make it really enjoyable and entertaining to read. And we talk about our inner narrator, where it comes from, the fact that it comes from past memories of failures, and our voice is actually trying to protect us. However, we need to recognize when it's no longer serving us. So as you listen to today's conversation, I invite you to think about the stories in your head and ask yourself, how is it serving you now? What do you want your story to be? And what are you going to name that inner narrator so that you can tell it where to go the next time he or she shows up? And with that, let's jump right into this powerful, fun, and enlightening conversation with Valerie Gordon. But first, a quick word from our sponsor, Thrive Chiropractic. I was first introduced to Thrive Chiropractic over five years ago for kinesiology-based food sensitivity testing. I was so amazed by this non-invasive and inexpensive technique that I took my son to have testing done, which confirmed some of his food sensitivities. Both my son and I now have regular tune-ups, and even my leery husband has felt the immense benefits from receiving chiropractic care, including cupping. With over 25 years of clinical experience, the doctors at Thrive Chiropractic, located in Minnetonka, Minnesota, combine their passion for wellness with a strong expertise in effective treatment approaches. When you first come to Thrive Chiropractic, the doctors are focused on helping you feel better as soon as possible and they recognize that one type of treatment or technique does not work for everyone. Your comprehensive exam, personal goals, and individual concerns help the doctors tailor your custom treatment plan for maximum results. Thrive Chiropractic's integrative approach offers holistic and effective healthcare with a full spectrum of complementary products and services, including acupuncture, massage, food sensitivity testing, CBD, and premium supplements. As a special offer, Thrive Chiropractic would like to invite listeners of our podcast to experience the gift of health with a $25 new patient visit, which includes the initial consultation, a comprehensive exam, any necessary x-rays, and first adjustment. Simply visit the website at www.thrivechiromn.com or call 952-746-5612 and reference the Arts of Living Well podcast. When you're seeking effective, non-invasive treatment approaches to support your health goals, let Thrive Chiropractic be your partner in wellness. Call or book online today. Hi, Valerie. We are so excited to have you on our podcast today to discuss how powerful stories we tell ourselves and how our narrator, our subconscious voice, affects our actions and our success and how we can overcome that self-criticism that many of us have. I also love that I discovered a couple of days ago, we have this mutual connection, Karen Fine. So that's always fun to talk to a friend of Karen's. And I thought we would get started by hearing your story. I know that it's probably long. So in a nutshell, if you could tell us how your journey of after 20 years of producing, you know, award-winning stories for various news outlets and HBO and ESPN and all these media outlets, um, how you changed gears and you now help clients discover the power 
and their own story and the art of storytelling for impact and influence. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Marnie and Stephanie, for having me as part of this story on your podcast. And why don't I take you right to the climax of my story, which was not actually a very good point in my story. Just picture me after 20 years of doing really hard work and um, feeling like, uh, you know, this is everything I had wanted in my career finding myself instead sitting on the floor of my closet crying to my dog because I had reached such a point of exhaustion and dissatisfaction in my career. And I remember just thinking, this is not how the story was supposed to go. I was supposed to be running a network. I was supposed to be waking up every day enthused and excited about what I was doing and nothing could be further from the truth. And that's when sort of this little inner voice said to me, but this is not how the story ends. So it was at that moment that I realized it was time to sort of write a new chapter and yes, pivot my career from what I had been doing into what I wanted to be doing next. The problem was I had no idea what that was. So it began a a real process of, you know, what does actively authoring your success look like and how can you take what you've been successful with in the past into your future while also sort of editing out all the stuff you don't want to do. So that's a really sort of long-winded way of saying that, yes, I, I had this background in storytelling, but when I had to figure out what my story was going to be about, I really had to go back to, to the beginning um, and, and rewrite it. And that all started with, you know, sort of examining the inner stories that I was telling myself at that time. So that's what I consider sort of the turning point in the story. If you find yourself crying on the floor of your closet, crying to your dog, um, it is time to write a new chapter. Oh, that's so funny. So can you share, before we kind of dive in and talk about what we want to chat about today, how did you, how did you start to do that? How did you start to rewrite your story? Because obviously that's impacting how you're influencing others. Yeah. Well, so often, isn't it that, you know, stories really start with um, maybe focus first on, on what isn't working for you. You know, stories of dissatisfaction, stories of conflict, stories of um, adversity, those are actually great stories. I mean, when, when I think about all the stories I put on television over, over the years, the number one theme, of course, is triumph over adversity. You know, we all root for the character who faces struggle before they find success. And yet in our own lives, who likes struggle? Who who likes conflict? You know, who likes dissatisfaction? And so those are some of the things that I call the unlikelies. They are um, unlikelies because they are story elements we don't like and that we think are unlikely to help us. But it's really a process of getting to know yourself again. And sometimes we have to start with what we don't want to figure out what we do. So for me, that became, you know, I was a busy working mom. I had um, missed out. I I hate to say it that way, but I had been so busy that the years went by very quickly and my kids were now teenagers and I started to feel the pull of time that in a few years they'd be graduating and leaving me. And I did have this career that I was very proud of, but that I no longer loved and was satisfied by. So I had to sort of rectify those two things and it just became about, well, what do you want now? which I think is such a great question that we should be asking ourselves regularly. What do you want now? And really kind of determining, okay, maybe we start with what we don't want. And we don't want to feel so busy. We don't want to feel tied to too many directions. We don't want to feel untethered or rushed, whatever it is, before we can even think about what we do want. But it's not an overnight process. You know, I think the first part is if you're lying on the floor of your closet crying to your dog, at some point you have to get up right? I mean, you're not, you can't stay there forever. So it just becomes about, okay, what's the next step from here? And oftentimes feeling those feelings of dissatisfaction or conflict, those unlikelies are a sign that you have a really great story that's about to begin if you're willing to, what I would say, turn that page. So did you just, yeah. So uh, what I'm wondering is, did you just start like writing Like, were you kind of going through writing exercises a little bit? You know, for me, yes, because that's what works for me. And Mm -hmm. while I recommend that to a lot of people, I realize that's not everyone's process. But I remember getting back to, I think the first thing I asked myself was, what do I really like and what am I good at? 
And my response to myself was words. Like I'm, I'm good with words. I've always enjoyed writing in my work, um, supervising pieces for television. I had gotten away from the actual creation into more of the supervision. And, you know, I wasn't really doing on a daily basis things that I loved. So one of the first things that I did was I started a blog And this was years after blogs were kind of like, they were almost passe at that point. And I did it for no one else, but for me. And partly that was because I did feel like I had so many words inside of me that I wanted to express that I almost felt like if I didn't get them out and I took a spill on the sidewalk, if I fell down, like all these words would come tumbling out of me. (laughs) So that was the first process because I had things to write about. I wanted to write about burnout at work and um, the complete absence of work-life balance, this myth that we've been sold and confidence and why so many women were leaving the workforce. I mean, I had all these things I wanted to write about. And so I think that was the first thing was thinking about what do I like? I like, uh, and I'm good with words. But the second thing was, what do I know? And I knew from my years as a journalist, putting stories on TV, I knew how to tell a great story, but I didn't want to keep putting stories on TV because I had done that and had reached a point where it was no longer satisfying. And then I thought, what am I passionate about? And over my years at work, I was really passionate about helping other women achieve and also really kind of perplexed as to why so many talented women dropped out, opted out, didn't rise to their level of potential were disengaged, you know, were being pulled in other directions. So it really became about, okay, how do I merge those things, my knowledge of storytelling, with my passion advocating for other women to find the success they deserve through the power of words? And then you start to see sort of linkages and things, you know, links, things that come together. And that's how I developed my first workshop, which was what's your story, how to, uh, you know, use storytelling strategies for success how did, how do we take command of our own lives, of our own career success? And that led to the creation of my career and communication strategy firm, Commander in She. But it was love not the name. Process. Side note, I love the name. <laughs> Thank you. That's um it's so it's so powerful. And what you're doing, I think, is so it's it's unique too. You know, I don't Marty and I have brought in a lot of different mindset type, you know experts and great guests on the podcast, but nothing in this space. So I just, I I love what you're doing. And I love the the questions that you ask that I think our listeners right now can be asking themselves are really powerful. You know, what am I good at? What do I like? What do I know? What I'm passionate about? And that has helped, you know, propel you forward into what you're doing today. So can we jump right in and talk about the narrators in our heads and or in our head, I should say. And what are the what, and what are the different types of narrators? Um, yeah, sure. So one of the things that I will say is you absolutely cannot create a great external story if you're struggling with a faulty inner story. And I call our inner stories. I say that that's it's from our inner narrator. A lot of people you might think of this as the, your inner critic, right? So this is the voice that talks you through your day. So that if you get up first thing in the morning and the first thing you do is you spill your cup of coffee all over your laptop, that voice. What did you just say to yourself? Because most people, particularly women, tend to have tend to have a highly critical questioning or doubting inner voice. And we think of that as an inner critic. But in my work with a number of clients and in hearing the kind of stories they would tell themselves, I I started categorizing the things they would say to themselves into narrative types. Because to me, it went beyond a critic. Not everyone had a critical narrator. Some had more of a questioning narrator. Some had more of like almost a belligerent narrator. And, um, And I came up with 10 different narrative types and the inner critic is, is just one. The critical narrator is one of those types. And after thinking about those types and how we might quiet them down in order to be able to not have them you know, influence our day, I wrote my first book, which is Fire Your Narrator, A Storyteller's Guide to Getting Out of Your Head and Into Your Life. Because when you think about it, that narrator, that daily voice kind of monologues throughout our day, kind of provides almost like a movie trailer, you know, voiceover throughout. And of all the characters in our story, there is no more influential character than your narrator. And it's so present that you almost don't even realize that it's there. 
But as I mentioned, that inner narrator creates your narrative point of view, the way you look at the world, the way you, the actions you take, the way you engage with other people. So you can't even start to think about the external story. What do I want to do? Who do I want to be? How do I make that happen? If you've got this inner voice that is working against you. And I will tell you that in writing this book and really researching and understanding the 10 narrative types, um, I became very familiar with my own narrator who sat on my shoulder the entire process of writing the book and would say such sweet things as, you're never going to finish this book. You know, you're so lazy. No one's going to read it. This is a dumb book. And so imagine writing a book about taming your inner narrator while you have a narrator like that on your shoulder. (laughs) So that's why I named her, which is one of the suggestions I have uh, as a tip to controlling that narrator. I named my inner narrator Squash because she tends to show up at really inopportune times and totally squash my confidence. So I like to lead when I talk to people about, you know, I know a lot about storytelling. And by the way, I have an invisible woman in my head named Squash who narrates my story daily. And people either get it right away. Yep, I know I have a voice like that too. Or they're perplexed enough to want to find more. So yes, there's an invisible woman. I picture her like this sort of Viking looking, um, very harsh woman named Squash. And she lives in my head. And I spend a lot of time telling her to, you know, to shut up. Yeah. Or maybe stronger things, right? I, I was just about to go there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could tell that you was on the edge of your tongue. <laughs> so I think I shared this with you the last time we spoke, but I have Flick, who I like to just flick off. Um, and tell me about Flick, because I'm very curious. First of all, I love the name Flick, and I love it because it's active in terms of flicking off. Like, you know, that voice is not helpful. So you want to flick it off your shoulder. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious to know, because I'm so curious about people's inner narrators, what are some of the unhelpful things that Flick tries to tell you? I mean, I've gotten really good at flicking Flick off, but, um, (laughs) but I, when I think when my confidence is feeling down, Flick likes to come in and, um, make it even worse, I would say. You know, like, like you said, I'm, I'm trying to write a book, you know, who's going to read your book? Are you going to finish your book? Like very similar to your squash actually, or, you know, you know, you don't sound good enough. You don't speak well enough, whatever it is. Um, just putting me down pretty much. I think Flick and Squash should have a play date and they can, they can spend some time entertaining each other. But it is true that they do tend to show up, that inner voice, that, that doubting or critical inner voice tends to show up when we are pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone, such as taking on a creative endeavor. I want to write a book. I've never done it before. Interviewing for a job choosing to leave a relationship, making any sort of big life decision. And so one of the things that I offer in the book, Fire Your Narrator, is the understanding that that narrator, Flick or Squash or whoever, you know, yours might be, actually thinks it's protecting us. It comes from, you know, past memories of failures. And and we have, by the way, far more tendency to remember negative events and positive. And those stories, there's neuroscience behind it, why those stories tend to stick with us more. So this narrator, this inner voice is actually operating um, from a sense of fear in thinking that it is protecting you. Don't put yourself out there because you might fail like the last time you did. Some people have a very strong ruminating narrator where they really only remember the bad stuff and and we can work on reframing that as well. But it's why um, particularly really talented, skilled women tend to hold themselves back from the opportunities they deserve. You know, you don't raise your hand in the meeting because maybe the idea is stupid. You don't enter the race because, you know, what if you finish last? That would be embarrassing. You don't speak up in a relationship because what if the other person gets angry. So that inner voice thinks it's protecting you when really it's holding you back from living your best story. And I can say for me that that moment revisiting, like, you know, crying in my closet, which I don't do often, it really just was that one time, but we'll we'll use it as a thread throughout, you know, the inner narrator at that point, squash at that point was probably squashing the next chapter by saying, you know what, 
just, just live with it. It's, it's fine. Like, what are you going to do, do next? If you're going to, you're going to totally reinvent yourself. You're going to leave your work. You're going to leave your identity. Who do you think you are? Because it's those moments of uncertainty. I think when we tend to talk to ourselves the most and that narrator goes into full effect. And while it seems to be like a really mean or harsh voice, I think ultimately we need to understand it, it thinks it's protecting us even though it really is holding us back. So a question for you on that, and just kind of like where the narrator comes from. A lot of times these voices come from experiences that we've had going back from like our childhood, right? So how do you address those situations in the past in order to be able to move forward and squash your inner voice? Such a good question, Stephanie, and you've really hit on one of the tips of the book, which is what is the origin story? So um, in the book, and when I work with clients, I I ask specific questions. If you want better answers, you have to ask better questions to try to get at when did you first start thinking this way? Or when do you recall maybe hearing this message? And oftentimes, you know, a critical or questioning inner voice can come from moments where you know, as a kid, maybe something negative happened or maybe an adult questioned us. I mean, how many of us were told like in fourth grade, like, oh, you're not good at math and, you know, went through life believing that and and never questioning that and making that part of our, part of our own narrative. So for me, I know I have what I would uh, consider one of the narrative types, one of my dominant types, because I would say that we don't all fit into neatly into one category. The book allows you to map your narrative type. And oftentimes people find they have two or three dominant types and maybe a few other secondary characteristics. And I've had a number of clients say they have all 10 represented in in the, you know, in their heads. It's not multiple voices. It's just sort of your own individualized voice. But I will say I have a very strong striving narrator, which is, comes from my ambition and my work ethic and all that I hope to achieve in my life. Sounds like a good thing, right? It is until that narrator tells you that you're never working hard enough, that it's never good enough, that you need to do more to prove yourself. And that's where a striving narrator can sort of overtake, you know, your daily action, your activities and lead to a really bad case of burnout, which is what happened to me, which is how I found myself, you know, um, crying on my closet floor. But I think I can trace that voice back to growing up as like a high achieving kid who always wanted to get the A's who, when I didn't, I felt like if only I worked harder, I could do more. And an early message that I might've received unintentionally or how I absorbed it that made me believe, look, you may not be the smartest person in the room. You may not be the most talented or the prettiest, but you can outwork anyone. And that led to a work ethic in me that I think for many years helped me do really well and to succeed, but also led to this inner voice, the squash of like, it's never going to be good enough. You know, you're always striving. And so I think it's a great question to ask, what's the origin of the story? When do I first recall kind of hearing it or creating it? Can I trace it back? And why did I make it such a part of my inner narrative? And some of those, that inner narrative can be helpful, right? Having a strong work ethic is, is helpful. But when it becomes almost too loud, when that narrative voice gets in the way of our um, satisfaction, our, our day-to-day happiness, when it impacts everything we do, that's when we need to learn to, ta- to turn the volume down on it. And so getting to the root cause can be really helpful. I love that you said getting to the root cause. That's something that Marnie and I talk about all the time in all aspects of health and wellness. So um, that's just such a great tip, everything that you just shared. Well, and I think so many people can relate to what you're talking about with striving. I mean, I I could relate to a lot of what you said. And I even think about just a lot of like, I have two daughters. I think about the messages girls get, but even boys too. Like you, like you, you said it so well, you can outwork yourself or what did you say? You can, you may not be, you know, the prettiest or the strongest or whatever, but you can work your way to the top in other ways. And I can see where that can leave people feeling like they're never enough. Like no matter what you do, you're never there. And I wonder how a person can learn to balance that where you still want to have that, you know, it's good to have ambition and strive for things, but 
you also need to be able to have satisfaction, right? With what you've accomplished and where you're at. And it's, I, how do you advise people to feel that, you know, not let that piece of themselves go, but feel that satisfaction where they are? Yeah. And it's such a challenge, isn't it, Marnie? And that's where I feel like feeling dissatisfied is the first clue that something's not working for you. So again, getting back to those un- unlikelies, it's not, if you're, you know, if your listeners right now, if anyone's feeling unhappy or, and by the way, who isn't with all of the, the challenges of the past couple of years, but unhappy or uncertain or anxious, that's actually a really great place to start the story. So just sort of sit with that feeling for a minute about like, what is it that I'm feeling and why am I feeling that way? And so many of those early memories, those early stories really do become Become embedded in our in our narrative. So I would very much start with, okay, so what is the story I'm telling myself? Whether the story is, you know, you're not working hard enough, or this won't work out, or, you know, um, things never go my way. I mean, we all have sort of these like overarching narrative beliefs. And I would say that you have to start questioning, first identifying what is that belief that I have about myself, and then questioning it. Where's the evidence? So for example, if you feel like things never go my way, you know, where's the evidence for that? Well, maybe you've had a few things recently that haven't gone your way, but I'm sure if we look deep enough, we would find plenty of times that things have gone well for you. Or if you're someone who has a very critical inner voice and you're always saying like, oh, you know, you're, I'm such a mess or, you know, look at you, you're so, you're so fat, you're so undisciplined. I mean, all these horrible, horrible things that we say to ourselves that we would never say to anyone else. First of all, who's talking? you know, that's your inner squash, your inner flick, name that voice, because it is someone, it's almost, you know, it's, it's this inner voice in you that you're allowing to lead your story. And secondly, where's the evidence? Who says it's true? So if you're constantly saying to yourself, I'm such a mess, I can't do anything right. First of all, what a horrible thing to say to yourself, but you know, where does belief come from? And where's the evidence that it's true? So if you spill your cup of coffee on your laptop and you say to yourself, I'm such a mess, I can't do anything right. Well, that spilling your cup of coffee is a circumstance. It's something that happened. Why are you making it an overarching character flaw that like guides your life, that now you believe you're a mess and you can't do anything right? I mean, just stop for a moment and ask yourself, who says it's so? And and where's the evidence for it? And then two other really good questions I like to ask, and they're so simple, but they do make you stop and think. The first is, so what? So again, if the, if the overarching thought, let's go with, I'm such a mess, I can't do anything right. So what? I mean, let's really think about what are the implications of that if it's, if it's, even, if it's even true. So nothing's ever going to go my way, so I'm always going to be you know, less than or unhappy. I mean, let's just follow that thought until we sort of run out of ways to ask so what and answer it. And then we can ask the next question, which is, now what? Okay, so, so what do you want to do with that? So if you truly believe that you're a mess and that nothing ever goes your way, now what do you want to do about it? And I go back to that moment of sitting in my closet, sort of crying about, like, this is not the way my career was supposed to go or supposed to end. And you can feel all the, you know, so what parts of it. But at some point, you do have to get up off the floor and out of the closet. So you can ask yourself, okay, well, now what? Now what do you want to do about it? Because you do have a choice. You can go back to work and just keep doing what you're doing. You can take the first steps to discover what you might do next. If you spill your cup of coffee on your laptop, you can decide that the day is a bust and go back to bed. Or you can get a paper towel and clean it up and, and move on. I mean, we are always in charge of the now what, of what happens next. So being able to sort of get out of your head and into your life really starts with identifying the inner story, seeking evidence as to whether it's true or not, and then realizing that you are the active author of what happens next. How do you want to use it? And are you going to let squash or flick or this awful voice that you let live rent-free in your head dictate what happens next? Or are you going to question it? And what I often find is that when clients can sort of turn down the volume on that unhelpful inner voice, they can turn up the volume in other areas of what they want to happen next. And Marnie, you said it best. It's just flicking that flick off your shoulder, right? That you're aware that this is unhelpful. And if you want to write a book, having that, that, that voice telling you you can't is not going to be helpful. So that actually, I love that, just that visual of flicking it off your shoulder. To me, um, that's a really helpful step step to take. 
Well, thank you. It took me a long time to uh, get there. So um, I, so I'm wondering, are there some like red flag words that narrators that people should avoid, I guess? Absolutely. They're red flag words and that they're good. If you hear yourself saying them, you can mm-hmm. know that's a red flag word. Let, let, word. let me look a little closer at what I'm saying to myself. And I actually have a chapter about that. And the first um, word that I would say is to, T-O-O, meaning that anytime you say to yourself, I'm too old, I'm too, you know, I'm too uh, late, I'm too loud. I'm too emotional. I'm too fat. Like I, you know, people who want to, you know, go to the gym and they say, well, I'm too heavy right now. Let me lose some weight first. How ridiculous is, how ridiculous is that? So two, T-O-O, when we say it to ourselves, is often a judgment, a judgment word. And that means we're judging ourselves, a very judgmental narrator. The other word I like to look for is just. I talk about why are we always justifying ourselves? And I hear it a lot when I talk to people. And what do you say when you meet someone for the first time? You tend to say, you know, what do you do? Which of course is a terrible first question, but that can put some people on the defensive. I hear this a lot. I'm just a mom. Well, just remove the word just. Why are you justifying the fact that you're a mom? I'm a mom. The sentence works without it. When we use the word just, we are somehow justifying to ourselves that who we are is is not enough. Um, another really big red flag word is should, you know, if you find yourself always saying that you should be doing something or shouldn't have done something, that's another judgment about your behavior. Um, people say there's a good phrase, stop shoulding all over yourself. (laughs) (laughs) That's not mine. I can't claim credit for it, but I do like it. Why do we always should all over ourselves? But I, I say one thing you can do is replace should with could. So, you know, oh, I should go to the gym. Well, you could go to the gym. You get to decide if you want to do that. You know, I should have kept quiet. I shouldn't have opened my mouth about that. Well, you could have, but you chose to speak up. So sometimes just substituting could for should is, uh, is helpful. And one other um, uh, word that I'll mention, or it's a phrase, is if only. If only is the catchphrase of what I would call a defeatist narrator, Um, because it makes that defeatist narrator feel like the current circumstances are unlikely to change. So so why bother? Well, if only I had, you know, taken that job 20 years ago, if only I hadn't gotten into that relationship, if if only I had started this book, you know, earlier. Um, Again, it's a judgment type, but it's also that narrator tends to use it as an excuse, as if the past story is now going to dictate the future. So I think it's really helpful to listen to some of those key words. And certainly there are others as well. And when you hear them to at least stop to examine, what is my thinking process? What am I making this story mean? I love these keywords. I could relate to so many of them, things that I do and things that I'm, you know, working on. Um, because it's almost like you, it turns you into like a victim of the situation instead of the conductor in your life. And I just think this is absolutely so powerful. And then even I found like recognizing when other people in your family or in your life are using or some of these keywords, because that's kind of a first step just to, if you can recognize it in someone else, it helps you reflect, even if, you know, without giving them advice, right. Unsolicited yeah. <laughs> advice about what they should be doing, which is a part of, you know, an issue for me a bit. Um, I just think this is, it's so powerful. Um, because it can really just keep us stuck in life, right? Uh, and, you know, as our podcast is about the art of living well, it really can prevent you from finding your art of living well. So I think this is great. And I hope everyone goes out there and, and gets the book. And maybe we can dive into that a little bit more um, right now. Just like I love how the chapters are all broken out into these actionable tips and the stories. And you've already talked about a couple of the narrators, but maybe you can expand upon that a little bit more and how you can take control of your script to, to, to create the life you've dreamt of. Right. And I think that the biggest thing is even realizing that these stories is, exist. We don't think of our own inner narr- narrative as a story, but it's very much how we think about our place in the world or how we interact with the world. So even just taking the time to kind of get into your own head, 
I think is really important. And I tell a lot of stories in the book because I, I tend to take sort of a, a humorous look at these stories we tell ourselves. Because if you actually think about them, they're, some of them are really ridiculous. We say things to ourselves that we would never say to another person. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if, if a friend called you and said, oh my gosh, I, you know, I broke my diet last night. I can't believe it. I went out and I, I had three drinks with friends and I ate a whole plate of nachos. And you know what you might say to yourself in that situation, you would never say to her like, well, gee, aren't you a fat pig? You can't, you know, you're <laughs> yeah. never going to lose weight, right? Like you would, she, she would never <gasps> be your friend again. So why would we talk to ourselves in yeah. a way that completely, you know, would never be permissible to talk to somebody else. So I like to unload sort of that thought pattern and and do it in a humorous way. And I, because I I believe in the power of story, I tell a lot of stories in the book. And and one of the stories that I tell is about on a typical trip to Target, how I go in for like three items and then walk out having spent $200, how this happens with regular (laughs) currents. If if anyone else is familiar with any big box store and, you know, and, and a particular trip where I didn't even find what I was looking for. And yet I filled my cart with all this other stuff that I thought that I needed. And on the way out, of course, the cashier says cheerfully, did you find everything you were looking for? And the answer of course is, well, no, I actually didn't find what I was looking for, but I found all this other crap that I'm now going to take home. And (laughs) pushing this cart, this heavy cart back to my car and like the one wheel is broken. And so it's unwieldy. And so it's difficult to push this cart. And it was in that moment that I realized that all this stuff I bought, some of which was helpful and useful, um, you know, I was now going to own, but that there was a lot in there that just no, I really didn't need. And it made me think about all this stuff in our cart. Think about the cart full of stories you carry around with you. And all the stories from our past, and again, given that our, our propensity re- to remember negative events over positive that tend to stick with us longer, I just wanted to ask the question, like, what's in your cart? And how often have you thought about emptying out that cart entirely of all those past stories, of all those experiences, of all those things that have created your present day narrative, and then only putting back in the things that are most helpful to you? And thinking about it like a shopping cart at Target, I thought became for me really powerful. You know, so I invite your listeners to just take the time to empty the cart. What's in there? What's that overriding thought that you've been carrying a lot around for so long that is really no longer serving you? And if you want to write a better story, if you want to create a, a better story, a better next chapter, if you want to live well, why don't we start? by unpacking the stories we're carrying around and, and only putting back the elements that we really want to keep about ourselves. We can't obviously always impact our outside world, the things that happen to us, the, the daily plot line, but we can avoid the additional hurdle of tripping ourselves up in our, in our own head. And so I like to think of it that way. And that's one exercise I have in the book is, is, you know, pretend your stories, unpack all the stories. And I give a lot of questions about how to find those stories and decide which ones you want to make still meaningful for you today and which ones might need to be reframed. And and I do want to say, I don't want to shortchange the challenge of people who have gone through traumatic events in their past and and the challenge of trying to reframe those stories. It it was no surprise to me that, look, there's a huge amount of psychology behind this process, and I am not um, a, a trained psychologist. I really just focus on the story angle. And I don't want to minimize how challenging this can be for everyone, um, regardless of your circumstances. This is not something that happens overnight, but it is certainly worth exploring. And I think that's one reason why I I take a humorous tone in in the book is I try to make light of some of our beliefs and our own, the power of our own stories. Uh, If it were, if such a section existed at Barnes and Noble, it would be in the snarky (laughs) self-help section. That's where it would live. I love your idea of the cart full of stories and emptying your cart and really going through and only keeping what's helpful. As I think about that process, I can think of people in my life that could really use that. And I feel like the people that could use it the most are the people that would put up the most resistance to to doing that. So I wonder, maybe I should just buy the book and give it as a gift. That's what I was thinking too, Marnie. (laughs) 
So just send them an anonymous book. Yeah. There is a narrator called the adamant narrator and the adamant narrator is very firm in its beliefs about why things are the way they are. And so mm-hmm. I have tips as well. If you have an, an adamant narrator, you know, this is the way, just, this is how I am and things will never change, you know, and I'm not, I'm not wrong. You are. Um, I have tips in there as well about how to recognize an adamant narrator. And we talked earlier, Stephanie, about the power of words. And so two words that I hear a lot with the adamant narrator are always and never. And so, Uh, you know, we can also sometimes get stuck in our own stories and our, and our belief in our own story. So I would just ask, how is the story serving you now? And, and what do you want it to, to mean? And while I realize the book won't speak for everyone, I do think that everyone will recognize themselves, their behavior in at least one of these narrative types, if not, if not more. And it just, you know, begs us to sort of stop and listen to our own inner story before we try to, you know, create what happens next in our, in our internal story, external story. Yeah. I just think this is so powerful. I love that question. How is the story serving you now? I think I'm going to use that with different members of my <laughs> my circle, if you will. Um, but if I think about all the different topics that we discuss on this show, what you're doing and rewriting your story impacts everything. Like you can't create a new habit. You can't start to go to the gym or lose weight or eat healthy or, you know, develop Enjoy, stronger, rela- stronger relationships. Yeah. If you, if you have all these stories that are holding you back, I mean, you, you can't in a sustainable way. So this is super powerful. Um, can you share maybe a story of someone that you've worked with, you know, and you talked a little bit about yourself and your journey and how they overcame their narrator and their fears and how that really impacted them? It's such a good question. And I can think of so many, um, different stories. And I think, um, Okay, so I will tell you the story of a client who didn't even realize she was holding herself back from next level success. And I would say it comes from from two narrators or inner beliefs that she had about herself. One was that she had to be a good team member, which she was. She absolutely was for, for, for many, many years. And yet she had this sort of like suspicion of like, well, when's it my turn? And I want more. And she had a narrator that I would say told her she was selfish for wanting more. Like you should just be happy with what you have. You should just be grateful um, for, for what you have. You know, how dare you, how dare you want more than this? And I think we talked a lot about how it's possible to be grateful for what you have. You can have this great life and you can have, she has two kids and she had this well-paid job, but she still fe- felt a sense of dissatisfaction. And so what we had to do was really separate that sense of gratitude for what you have from that desire for more. You can be grateful for what you have and still want more. You can earn a good salary and still want to go in and ask for a raise. It doesn't make you a bad person. And um, one other way that she was holding herself back from looking for that next level success was she thought someone who was going to question her as to whether or not she deserved it. And it took a while to kind of get there, but we were talking about, you know, posting some, um, she was active on LinkedIn, which is a you know, professional platform. And I think she was very afraid that she would post something about a project she was working on or her thoughts on, on something in her industry and that someone would question her right to be there. And it was such an interesting thing to explore with her because the only person questioning her right to be there was her own inner narrative you know, and this fear of, well, someone else might question you. And again, we talked about how that inner narrator is, is, is born and thinks it's protecting us. Well, if you put yourself out there, yeah, there might be someone who questions you. Is, is that enough to want to, you know, make you hold yourself back? And at the same time, she was, when we talked about the evidence, where's the evidence? She said, you know, I see a lot of people, guys in her industry posting this stuff. And I think, well, who are they? To, you know, they don't know more than me. And I'm like, well, there's your evidence that you are ready to post too, you know? So, so she was someone who, who very much um, judged herself before even taking the action and was able to negotiate her way out of making courageous choices. And long story short, she ultimately left a position that she liked, but that she felt was limiting to her. She took um, a period of time doing some consulting type work while she got comfortable with sort of rebranding herself. And what she found was by putting herself in new situations with new people who didn't maybe know her before, she was able to see how they valued her expertise 
in ways maybe that she hadn't been valued before or valued herself. And I'm happy to report she now has a much higher level position at a really terrific company. Didn't happen overnight. I would say it was probably a two-year process for her, but, um, but she absolutely saw the results of how she was limiting herself holding herself back and able to kind of rewrite that narrative by just figuring out like, well, who is going to judge me and wh- and why am I judging myself? Well, and I wrote down how you said, so what, right? So that, yeah. so somebody's judging me now. Yeah. what? <laughs> and someone always is, you know, right. but, but, you know, do we want to let that, that stop us? That was a kind of a, a long-winded story, and, and I'm wondering if I might be able to, to tell a better one or just give a better tip. We talk about you know the way that we talk to ourselves, we would never talk to to a best friend. And so there is another exercise in the book about best friend versus worst critic. If your inner voice, your squash or your flick or whatever you want to you know call name that character that lives in your head, um, talks to you like, you know, a worse critic, what would your best friend say in that situation? Or what would you say to a best friend if they were struggling with the same thing? If you're struggling with sitting down to write the book because, you know, Flick is judging you, what would your best friend tell you to do? They'd probably just tell you to, you know, trust yourself and sit down and bang out a page and see what happens. So oftentimes just doing a complete 180 on that voice, um, is, is helpful. You know, how would you advise someone else if they were saying those things to themselves? That's a great tip. And I'm wondering, you shared so many amazing tips during this conversation. I'm wondering what would be like one of your top suggestions for someone listening to this podcast, you know, right now to squash or flick or whatever, get rid of their, not not necessarily get rid of their inner narrator, but change the story with their inner narrator. I would start by saying, this is your story. And by story, I mean, this is your life. So what happens next? What do you want to happen next? And what are you, what are you waiting for? And are you going to let this inner voice that's talking you out of it or telling you that, you know, you're not worthy or good enough or that you're not ready? Do you want that to be the leading voice? of, you know, of the story. Um, because ultimately we are in charge. And I think if we can quiet down that, that critical questioning, doubting voice enough, you can listen to your true inner voice, which comes a little more from your gut and your heart than an overthinking brain. So I would just say, yeah, what, what do you want to happen next? This is, this is your story. You do get to choose. No one else is writing this thing. For you. And if you reach a point where, you know, your current story really doesn't work for you, well, start thinking about, about what might, um, treat every day, like a, a, a blank page and you can edit out what's not working and start creating things that, that, that might, you know, work better for you. I, I feel like your life's work is to figure out your life's work or your life's meaning and get, get busy writing. This is your story. Mm, I love that. And I, I, I do think, I know we talked a little bit about writing in the beginning as, as being a technique, even for those out there that aren't writers or don't consider themselves, you know, a writer or even like journaling, I do think getting out of getting a notebook and starting to answer some of these questions when you have some quiet time would have such a profound impact. Yeah. And I love Fire Your Narrator is a workshop for that reason where, you know, I give tips from the book, but we can actually workshop it. You don't necessarily have to be a writer. Some people don't like journaling. Some people like to visualize, don't like visualizing, but I am a big believer in the power of words. Again, this, this journey started with words. So let's look at the words that we are using to describe ourselves or talk about ourselves as, as a starting point for examining those stories. Yeah, well, Valerie, can you tell people where people can find you? You mentioned the workshop. We've mentioned the book, but you know, can people sign up for your workshop? Can you just let everyone know? Sure. Yeah. So you can find out more information about Fire Your Narrator at fireyournarrator.com, or you can certainly just go to Amazon to order it. By the way, I will tell you, I noticed on Amazon the other day, um, someone gave me a one-star review with no comments and, and immediately like, it was like, oh, somebody didn't like your book. You know, Squash started talking to me. And then I thought, oh, Squash, did you do that? Like, that's my Squash go jumping in there and giving a, (laughs) giving a one star just for the heck of it. Um, Otherwise, I would say it's been nicely reviewed, but isn't it funny how we start telling ourselves those stories? So yes, mm-hmm. you can order the book off of Amazon or Barnes and Noble or go to fireyournarrator.com for more information. The name of my company is Commander in She. 
S-H-E, Commander and She, and you can go to commanderandshe.com, um, works with or without hyphens, to find out more about the, um, the workshops that I do um, to get. You can actually go, and if you sign up for my newsletter, you can download the first two chapters of the book for free. So you can see if that is intriguing enough for you to um, to pick up your own copy. And I run um, monthly webinars on everything from our inner stories to our external brand. Again, how do we use storytelling to create um, happy and successful careers and, and next chapters in our lives? I love it. I love everything you're doing. Um, so this has been an awesome conversation, Valerie. As we wrap up, one thing we ask all of our guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? Such a great question. And I love that you probably get a, such amazing insight from all your guests. I would say the art of living well is identifying and creating your true story, the one that you were meant to live. And part of firing your narrator is getting rid of all the clutter or the noise, the old and unhelpful stories, so that you can start creating the story that you were most meant to live. That is so beautiful. Absolutely love it. You said it so well. Um, and you're right. We do love, we do love the, this question and what our guests have to say and all these unique, unique responses that we think really can help others, you know, just that little bit of extra motivation and inspiration to, to end this conversation. So thank you so much, Valerie. Um, and we highly, we'll link up everything, you know, all the links will be in the show notes and the book really is quite, it's a very quick read and it's humorous. And there's, I love all the different stories. We didn't even get to touch on some of them that you have in the book. So everyone go out there and, and buy Valerie's buy book for your narrator. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun to talk to you both. Yeah, you too. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook, where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.